Hello, everyone. We're starting the webinar now. Hi, I'm Angelika from Juban. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the first webinar of our Cultures of Peace Festival of the Northeast 2021. This year, the Cultures of Peace Festival looks at feminist responses to ecology through the themes of activism, academia, and performing arts, and also lists a series of webinars, podcasts, video interviews, etc., on various aspects of ecology, climate crisis, and ecology in performing and creative arts in the Northeast. The program is cur curated by Angela Rangat and I, Tingna Manjulika Samo from Manipur. We begin this webinar series with panelists Seno Sua, Bonozit Hussein, Bhaktora Mar Moro, and Amra Pali Basumatri discussing agricultural practices and ecological challenges in Northeast India. Agriculture is the mainstay of the indigenous communities in Northeast India. The webinar will highlight agricultural practices in the region vis-a-vis -vis its sustainability, economy, and feminization, while also exploring the role globalization, marketing, and ecological crisis has played in changing these practices. The webinar will be moderated by Angela Rangat. Just a few introductions be before we begin the webinar today. Juban is a feminist publishing house and NGO that chronicles and participates in women's movement in India and South Asia. For more details, please, vi please visit jubanprojects.org and jubanbooks.com. We are conducting, conducting this webinar as part of Juban's Cultures of Peace Festival of the Nordic program, which is a collaborative project run by Juban and the Hendrik Ball Stiftung Regional Office, New Delhi. The project aims at creating spaces for dialogue within civil societies in the eight northeastern states of Arunachal Pradesh, Assam, Meghalaya, Manipur, Mizoram, Nagaland, Tripura, and Sikkim, and contiguous regions. Through diverse forms of cultural production, like writing, music, film, theater, media, art, and more, this ever-evolving festival attempts to foreground many key issues that concern the region and its relationship with the rest of India or the mainland against a broader framework of gender identities, indigenous rights, and peace building. In 2020, as part of the 10th, 10th year celebrations of cultures of peace, a, a multimedia resource media archive was created to bring together the learnings from the past decade, uh, from the past decade and to house video interviews, podcasts, essays, and artwork that showcase the work of artists, writers, musicians, and other cultural practitioners we have engaged with over the last decade. The building of the archive in 2020 was supplemented by a series of online engagements centered around the two themes of food cultures of the Northeast and women yes, in music. conducting the seminar as part of the one, the one which is and, the one in history course. And Which women in music in the North. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, the building of the archive, uh, the media archive uh, in 2020 was supplemented by a series of online engagements centered around two themes of uh, food cultures of the Northeast and women in music in the Northeast. Five webinars and film release were organized. You'll find them in our YouTube channels. While the production of the materials such as video interviews, podcasts, and essays are also underway. Activities for the two teams, music and food, were curated by two different curators, Honzoi Barbara for food culture and Anungla Joy Longkumar for music. This year, we will be releasing the curated materials from Cultures 2020 and also creating more, more resources such as essays, podcasts, feminist interviews, feminist lab sessions, et cetera, to further our engagement and support the ongoing discussion in the Northeast. Find out more about this project through the link which we are providing in the, in the chat box. I would now like to introduce our speakers for today. Seno Suha is a community development worker and a school teacher from Nagaland.
um, Angela, I think Angelica's Dr. Mauro is a uh, University of Delhi, and Angela Rangat is an activist associated with the tour in Meghalaya. Before we start, I would like I would like to just go over the rules for the participants attending today. First of all, thank you for being here. Uh, your video and audio have been automatically turned off on entry. Please do keep them turned off. Audience questions will be taken via the chat box, which we will close once we get a certain number of questions that can be answered today. However, however the race and function will still be available to direct any queries to the panelists. We will start dealing with audience questions around 4.50 p.m. If there's any speaker in particular you want to di direct your question to, please make sure to mention that as well. The discussion will be recorded and posted via our social media channels. If you choose to ask a question or, or, or uh, via the chat box or, or you want to speak, your name will be displayed you against trolling. No head speech targeting or discriminating any community will be tolerated. Any participants using such speech will be removed from the webinar without warning. Before quoting any speaker outside of this webinar, please make sure to write to us at contact at jubanprojects.org for clearance. Participant details will be shared with uh, Hendrik Balls Tifrum. Uh, please write to us again if you, you would like your participation, uh, participation to remain anonymous. I will now hand this over to Angela. Angela. Thank you so much, Angelica, and welcome to everybody. I think uh, it appears there are some 36 of us today who are going to participate uh, in this webinar. And uh, I think the introduction has also been done by Angelica. So without uh, really taking too much time, uh, let me say that we're all hoping that this webinar will look at some of the uh, things we keep hearing around agriculture. Most of us are not practicing farmers and we may not know too much, but we may think we know because we hear these catchphrases all the time, you know, about sustainability of agriculture, um, about um, uh, climate change and how it's affecting agriculture, uh, about whether we can really <clears throat> preservation and uh, whether agriculture is in crisis. Uh, and of course, uh, the big thing in the region is this whole uh, emphasis or discussion about organic farming. Is it really possible? Is it really happening? So welcome to all the panelists. And without taking much more time, I think I would request Senu uh, to begin the discussion by telling us um, about your experience in agriculture and uh, telling us about uh, the activities you've been involved in. After Senu, I would like to invite Bonojit uh, after that, uh, Bhaktoram Moro and then Amrapali Basumatri uh, for, you know, opening comments to share with us uh, about your experience in the field, after which we can have a discussion um, because I expect that the speakers would already throw up some things around which we can discuss. And then towards the last 20 minutes or even half an hour, we can open up this discussion to uh, answer some queries which the participants may put up. So over to you, Sen. Uh, thank you, Angelica, for the introductions, and Angela, uh, for giving me this uh, opportunity to be part of the Zuban Culture of Peace Festival of Northeast 2021. And uh, the cock crowing in the uh, background of Angelica, I, I should say it's a good start because, you know, poultry, animal husbandry, livestock rearing are all part of agriculture and that's very common in our region. Yeah, so and Angelica has already like introduced me, but I also identify myself as a farmer's daughter and an ardent nutri gardener and uh, a practitioner of uh, ecological agriculture. I would like, uh, you know, to uh, give a very, like, small background of the Northeast region, maybe just in one, two sentences. Um, that Northeast 
India is a very rich biodiverse region, one of the 34 biodiversity hotspots of the world. And it houses more than 65% of India biodiversity. However, this is in the state of depletion owing to different you know, interactions with, I mean, by the human beings and in the name of development. The development paradigm is shifting and we are you know, like very fast, or I should say we are speeding up that you know, the, the subsistence economy or the solidarity economy is being replaced by cash economy. And this has also led to, you know, like uh, the communities to alienate ourselves with uh, the, the biodiversity that has provided us food, that has provided us life for, you know, many, many years, I should say centuries or thousands of years. Uh, so, you know, like, I would like to stress uh, very, very shortly on, uh, you know, like uh, two, three points. One is how, you know, like the, the region locates ourselves with agriculture. In the past, it is, you know, like the, the agriculture used to be the mainstay of our livelihood, our occupation, be it indigenous communities or others, be it the people from the hills or from the valleys. And we, we, can categorize uh, ourselves, you know, like agriculture practices, which is like one is the upland hill farming and one is the uh, lowland uh, farming, which is mostly settled uh, agriculture. And uh, the, the uh, uphill is mainly gym cultivation. And I come from the hills and I have been, you know, like from, I mean, I'm from Chagasan community and, you know, the there is cultivation, pedi cultivation on the slopes of the mountains and the June cultivation on the slopes of the mountains are the hallmark of our communities, uh, farming practices. And I have been part of, you know, like as, you know, a small child and as a growing adult and till now I've been like associated with that community. And I could also see, you know, like the kind of changes that is coming, uh, coming in, and quite visible in the last, uh, you know, like uh, uh, two, three decades, even in my own community, I stay in the village. And so I have been like observing and then also like I have been, you know, like associated with Northeast Network for more than two decades. So that way I also, you know, get a lot of opportunity to work with rural communities, both within my community and also like uh, other districts, other ethnic groups, other parts of the, you know, region also. So, you know, like what I have been, you know, like um, thinking of, you know, sharing in the next couple of minutes is, you know, the kind of changes that we could see and what was, what is still there, but what is under threat. The subsistence agriculture, or I should say like the ecological agriculture, which is, which has sustained our communities for many, many years, for centuries together is under threat because this particular, you know, practice is viewed as something which is primitive, which is something to do with not very visible, doesn't have any commercial value and whatnot, you know, like that kind of tag that is given is very common nowadays. And there is a push for cash crop. There is a push for, you know, like commercial agriculture. And this we can see in terms of, you know, like pushing ginger cultivation, pushing, you know, like cardamom cultivation, pushing, you know, like, Thick plantation. And these are all like pushed in the name of, you know, like the market, uh, I should say, profit uh, maximization or market oriented. And this is considered to be, uh, you know, like important uh, and something that, you know, people need to adapt with in order to, you know, uh, have economic, you know, like uh, development or, you know, like you know, livelihood security. And that is the kind of, you know, like the push that is being, even like it has reached to remote uh, 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 remote corners in our region. And I would like uh, also, you know, to see like uh, how even, even the kind of challenges that, you know, uh, the, the we, we, we as communities are facing is, also, you know, like the, the kind of challenges is not only the development paradigm shift, which is, you know, cash economy over 
subsistence economy or solidarity economy. There is also this climate crisis. There is also we see you know a lot of you know like feminization of agriculture. A lot of migration happening. A lot of you know like uh, women are left to tend the farmland. Be it small or big. And also you know like uh, we also see a lot of you know uh, the kind of uh, uh, emphasis that is given uh, uh, when we call when we we look up to the modern agriculture which is on based on few things which is based on few seeds which is based on you know uh, uh, which is based on uh, monoculture or mass production and so here oh uh, before i end what i want to emphasize is how do we strengthen ecological farming? How do we recognize women's role in strengthening and taking forward of uh, the, the, this ag agroecological agriculture, which is based on renewability, which is based on sustainability? How do we see or how do we acknowledge women's role in, you know, like saving the seeds, taking the, I mean, keeping the seed, saving heritage alive? How do we value their knowledge, their capacity to even like, you know, like uh, address the climate crisis that we are all facing? I think these are the questions that we need to, uh, to uh, ponder upon as we look or as we take, uh, you know, like our region, a biodiverse rich region, of course, with difficult topography, hilly mountain areas, but how do we, uh, you know, go ahead? I think that's something that we all need to. Uh, put our heads and hearts together to see that we become a self-reliant, you know, food communities, uh, 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 which is, you know, like, which should be, you know, like, for, for the well-being of the communities, not just one few people, but a self-reliant, you know, and the well-being of the communities. So thank you, I end here. Uh, thanks, Sanu. So before, uh... We can hear from you, Bonajit. I think Senu has already thrown up uh, several contentious points. So uh, if you can tell us, you know, what really is agriculture? Is what we do in our kitchen garden agriculture? Uh, has the region ever been um, had food security? Or historically, have we always depended uh, on the outside, you know? And can we ever achieve that kind of uh, food security, and if you can at least also uh, talk about um, ecological agriculture, is there such a thing? Uh, is it possible? And uh, sort of also let's discuss really about whether we have a choice of the kind of agricultural practices we do, and uh, whether it's really a myth that uh, there is this very stark division between commercial agriculture and sustainable agriculture. Yeah, uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Angela. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, you have uh, raised uh, some very important question and I'll try to address them while I kind of generally uh, present a picture of the crisis of agriculture in Assam. Uh, but even within Assam, I will be uh, talking about uh, the lowland agriculture. Uh, I won't talk about the three hill districts of Assam because the agricultural practices and systems there are uh, similar to Meghalaya and Nagaland and other hill states of the Northeast. So we already have two speakers. Shano had already uh, talked about it. Uh, Mr. Maro will also talk about it. So I'll restrict myself to the uh, Brahmaputra Valley. Uh, <clears throat> historically, uh, if we look at it, uh, in the Brahmaputra Valley, uh, the indigenous communities, both uh, tribal and non-tribal uh, indigenous communities, uh, for centuries they've been involved in uh, subsistence uh, level of farming. Uh, it, it's, it's more of a kind of, you know, backyard kind of vegetable farming, and then uh, you have paddy, 
uh, Pedi is the mainstay of uh, the Brahmaputra Valley as far as agriculture uh, goes. So if you travel through uh, Brahmaputra Valley, you will see that uh, seven months a year, the fields are lying fallow. Uh, because usually people would grow, even though uh, we can grow Pedi uh, thrice a year, uh, people would prefer to grow it only once uh, in one of the three seasons, uh, depending on uh, the land and availability of water and things like that. Uh, whereas uh, there are some districts in Assam, uh, in the valley, uh, where you in fact have uh, commercial farming, uh, commercial farming of high value cash crops, uh, vegetables mostly. Uh, but interestingly, there is an ethnic dimension to that. Uh, these districts are mostly inhabited by uh, people who migrated from uh, East Bengal during the colonial times, mostly during the colonial times. Uh, when the British encouraged them to come and settle in what uh, the British identified as the wasteland, which was actually the commons, uh, so the peasants from East Bengal was precisely encouraged because they already had exposure to market economy and commercial agriculture. Uh, so commercial agriculture is just restricted to a couple of districts. Uh, even then, it's not sufficient. Uh, I mean, we don't produce, uh, we are not self-sufficient. Assam is not self-sufficient in vegetable. More than 50% of our vegetable comes from outside of Assam. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, that leaves us with Pedi. Uh, Pedi is the mainstay. But even in Pedi, uh, what's really happening is uh, <clears throat> that uh, our productivity is very low. Uh, Assam's per hectare average Pedi production is right now it's 1,935 kilograms. Compared to Punjab, I mean, Punjab produces 7,415 kilograms a hectare. So it's almost four times uh, lower in Assam. Uh, and actually it's a loss making enterprise which every year we engage in. And how it's loss making, I'll, I, I would like to just point out. Uh, we have done some calculations and there are some calculations by Assam Agriculture University also. Uh, per hectare, it costs us uh, around 27,500 rupees if we, uh, if we calculate the wage of the family labor, uh, including the uh, women of the household who would participate in pedi sowing uh, in lower Brahmaputra Valley, in upper Brahm Brahmaputra Valley, uh, women participate in harvesting of uh, pedi as well. So uh, we spend around 17, uh, 27,500 rupees uh, per hectare uh, in sowing. Uh, I mean, sowing to threshing and harvesting everything. Uh, and then since uh, APMCs are non-functional here, uh, we are completely re reliant on traders uh, who are again, uh, mostly uh, non-indigenous from outside of the state. The rice economy in Assam is totally controlled by uh, uh, business interests from Western India. So we end up selling, uh, right now the MSP for Pedi is 1,868 rupees. But I, I have been selling my Pedi for 900 rupees a quintal, uh, which is almost 1,000 rupees less than MSP. Uh, so even if I say, let's say that, let's increase it. Let's say hypothetically, let's say uh, we get 1,250 rupees a quintal. Uh, even then, uh, if we sell our, uh, I mean, if you multiply the average production, which is 1,935 kilograms, then you end up uh, at the rate of 1,250 per quintal, you end up getting 24,300 rupees or something like that. So actually farmers, uh, petty farmers in Assam are making a loss of around 3,500 or 3,200 rupees per hectare. Uh, they don't realize it mostly because they don't calculate the wage of the family labor. Uh, so why are people continuing with the uh, paddy farming if it's not remunerative? There are various reasons for it. There's a pressure of tradition. Uh, often in a village, if, you're, if you don't cultivate paddy at least once a year, then, I mean, it's a matter of shame uh, in the village. 
so there is a pressure of tradition. And then uh, what happens is, uh, even if it's a loss making uh, endeavor, if you have grains in your granary, uh, it acts like, uh, you know, uh, it gives a sense of security. Uh, if your child is sick, uh, you sell a couple of mounds of your pedi and then you take your child to a doctor. If you have to pay fee, suddenly you have to pay uh, your uh, child's school fee for uh, six months, you haven't paid. So again, you sell two mounds of pedi and pay. So it's a kind of savings. Uh, so this is one reason why people are continuing with pedi farming. <clears throat> But there is a greater ecological challenge coming uh, uh, in, in this system, uh, how things are operating right now. Because people are not making enough money, uh, after paddy harvest, from January till April, if you go to any paddy field in Assam, you will see that there are you know, dozens of tractors in every field and they're, they're digging up the top, topsoil. Because the farmer, since the farmer is not able to earn any money, uh, from the farming practices, what he or she does is sell the topsoil to these tractor wallas uh, and they get 50 rupees per trailer. And then the tractor guy sells it to someone uh, you know, who requires uh, earth for earth filling for three, 300 rupees a trailer. So at a very fast pace, Assam in the valleys is losing the topsoil. It's going to create a massive ecological crisis, uh, perhaps 20 years down the line. Uh, so that's really the state of agriculture in Assam uh, right now. Uh, now comes the question of uh, subsistence farming. Uh, should we really be kind of defending subsistence farming? Uh, I am not sure, uh, having, having been farming for last three years and living in the village uh, and farming with the community. Uh, one of the problems, the crisis, uh, people are actually surviving on uh, government schemes, various government schemes. They have food security, they have grain security uh, because they have their own grains in the granary plus uh, Assam government gives under the uh, uh, PDS uh, system uh, per person, per head you get five kilo rice, which is good quality rice. So uh, grain security is there. But uh, unlike 30 years ago or 40 years ago, I have seen in my own household, village household, when my uh, uncles and grandparents were alive, uh, we have seen that uh, growing up as a child, we have seen that, uh, you know, the only thing that the household would buy from market uh, would be salt and kerosene oil. Uh, everything else, uh, the household would produce on its own. They have mustard, so they make their own oil. Uh, they used to cultivate a bit of sugarcane so they can make jaggery. You already have the pedi. And also, uh, our uh, traditionally, I mean, uh, our food habit is such that we are also uh, dependent on uh, wild herbs and greens. There are around 110 to 15 uh, wild uh, herbs and greens that we eat. Uh, so, but post-liberalization, what has happened is that the rural life world, a large part of the rural life world has been taken over by market. And your only source from where you can try and earn cash so that the uh, part of your life that has been taken over by market, there you cannot survive without cash. Right. I think what you're saying, Bonojit, there's just so much there. <laughs> and mm. uh, I'm sure we can get back to those issues. Uh, perhaps it'll even be more interesting to hear uh, from the situation in uh, Meghalaya. Hopefully Bhaktu can highlight some of that. And mm. then we back to some of the things you were saying, but uh, really 
uh, I think we can um, focus on this whole crisis. There's so, it's so multifaceted, the crisis <laughs> that you're highlighting. Uh, but um, can, we, can we get in Bhokto now? And if Bhokto can share, and then we can uh, together then discuss uh, this larger thing. So I think, um, Bhokto, you'd like to first play a small clip, right? Before yes, you yes. Sharing. And as we all know, this is a one hour long, unfortunately, uh, webinar, so the time is already 4.30, we have another 30 minutes and we can go on, but uh, may I request these opening remarks to be a little brief so that we can then continue with the, some of the issues that Bonojit and Senu has thrown up. We also have uh, Amrapali uh, to speak, so Bhaktu, you can carry on. Uh, I'll start the uh, share screening. Uh, yes. Yeah, I have also, uh, I'm going to upload a YouTube link on the chat box as well, in case well, while watching the video, if anyone experiences a lag in the video, because sometimes Zoom does that, you can go to the YouTube link in the chat box, and you can watch the video, it's for one, uh, one minute, 20 seconds, and then you can come back and join the webinar, you do not need to exit the webinar, you can just use it on a side panel. Kita di Nongret di Bala, Bandri, Bansumar, Tumia di Sembang, juga kita di Experian di Jongki, Kila Bantunia Tumia di Kinyang. Bak kila persang lu banlek ya kita ki eksperimen ki jongki dah ke ba ki persang banlek iki ni kijing start dan dry ni hab ban hikai ki kena Yeah so I think uh, the video did lag I guess should we play it again or should we move on because uh, what we can do perhaps uh, the link can be shared yeah so you have shared the link yeah. you can just give us a gist of that but, video and um, what you were trying to share with us through that and talk about uh, some of those um, experiences now which uh, in these villages where you work uh, thank you very much Zuban, for inviting me to talk in this forum. And yeah, uh, I'm working as a senior associate in NESPAS, which is working on indigenous food system, and which is a food system practiced by indigenous people. And what has been found is that this indigenous food system that we are practicing has been going on for many, many years, thousands of years. In fact, when agriculture was first discovered 10,000 years ago, until now, we have been surviving on agriculture. So, I mean, the commercial farming that people talk about, the industrial farming people talk about the last 200, 300 years, the fossil based industrial farming we're talking about is just recent so it's very surprising to think that we were not surviving all those thousands of years ago suddenly now 200 years ago it has become uh, i would say it has become like uh, impossible to survive on that maybe it has to do with the economic system we are living in like bonaji has talked about the liberalization which has taken place how in fact if you look at liberalization and how the agriculture has declined after that if you look at the trend so which means there are some economic policies regarding that which we should have to look about but coming back to the indigenous food system that i'm working in right now this indigenous food system and indigenous people have been treated 
for actually maintaining the biodiversity of the globe. 80% of the biodiversity in the world exists in indigenous lands, which means that in those lands where indigenous people are staying, which means that in those lands where indigenous people are practicing their food production system, which is jhum, which is terrace cultivation that Sunil talked about, beautiful terraces in Pakistan, I mean, very beautiful. And then, so this system actually has been surviving thousands of years, has been very ecological. So it is very difficult to understand now, how is it that we can't survive now? Maybe there are, maybe you need a change in the economic paradigm, which has been going for the last 20 years. Now, our own research in NASPA showed that when we did a survey in Nagaland, Nagaland in Meghalaya, we found that this system has actually, actually a lot of biodiversity. Diversity. So you talk about how we are part of the Indo-Burma biodiversity hotspot, a lot of biodiversity. But there's also another biodiversity called agrobiodiversity, which are the plants, organisms, animals, which human beings use for food consumption. We found that in Meghalaya and Nagaland, there are more than 200 food plants in one village, average village. And half of those come from the forest. So I think when you talk about the indigenous food system, it's not just about the farmland, it's also about the forest, the water bodies, there's a whole ecological knowledge around it. And women play a very important role in our case, because like Congridian, you, you saw just now her video, she actually today, we got the news yesterday that she was able to propagate this organic tomato from like them so, Sora, and she has been able to share the seedlings with other farmers in her own community. So I feel like, uh, yeah, the indigenous farm food system, indigenous people's food system is very sustainable. In fact, it's needed the hour. In fact, there has been recognition from the international bodies that we need a sustainable agriculture because industrial farming we talked about, forget the commercialization. 20% of the greenhouse gas emission comes from industrial farming. What are you going to do with that? Are you going to allow the climate change to just go haywire? We already are seeing the effects of that. So there has to be a change and there has to be a change because if you look at the industrial farming system, it's a byproduct of the Second World War, the war period when the excess fertilizers, excess chemicals. So they were so they were then diverted into agriculture in the hand of multinational corporations. So I feel, I mean, like, uh, and, and we did our own survey in Meghalaya in terms of can Meghalaya feed itself? And we found, yes, there is a gap, but that gap is because I believe that when we looked at the way how the, how the production data was being collected from all over Meghalaya, there are some gaps here and there. In fact, that study did not, that those reports from the Meghalaya government did not even take into consideration the many things come from the forest and from the land system, the, the wizard kitchen garden, which is a very, very important like food production system everywhere in Northeast. So I feel that, is it possible that we can have self-sufficiency? We were self-sufficient, we, we were surviving for thousands of years before industrial farming. Yes, there has to be some changes because the context has changed. In that regard, there are some problems. In fact, climate change has thrown many problems, especially pest issues. This year, we had a report from South West Kata Hills. The rice production has will be affected because of pests, and those pests are from climate change. Now, again, here, indigenous farming system, indigenous food system has the solution. Solution is genetic diversity. It's not solution, it's not commercial farming because you're going to destroy the planet. You're going to excess fertilizer, at least with eutrophication, which will decline of uh, biodiversity, which will cause in the book Silent Spring. The beginning of environmental movement started with how industrial farming has led to decline of biodiversity all around the world and the health problems. So the problem is, is so we are, if you're thinking in, only in terms of money, cash economy, market economy, I mean, you don't need to think about anything. You just think about the GDP, you think about how we can make more and more money. By thinking about sustainability, which is not a fact, it's actually a truth, you will have to think about indigenous people's food system and the role of women. Because in our case, we found that most of the custodian farmers who are working with NASPAS in Meghalaya and Nagaland are women. In fact, women are supposed to be the one who discovered agriculture. So women's role is going to be very, very important in our case. And that's what I want to say from my side. But thank you. Thanks, uh, Bhaktu. Uh, so, you know, uh, what we heard from uh, women is about the fact that uh, paddy farming is actually uh, what people, people are experiencing a loss and yet carrying on because of tradition. So, you know, uh, we would like to hear from uh, Amra Pali now uh, and uh, Bhakto Seno uh, stressing this fact that uh, uh, at that level, uh, women play a very crucial role. But um, do you think that perhaps we also in this crucial role that we are assigning to them, we're also burdening them with this uh, idea that they have to carry forward indigenous food systems. And uh, despite the climate crisis and everything else that the market is throwing up, what do you have to say on this, uh, Amar Pali? Yeah, hi. Uh, hello, everyone. And thank you for uh, allowing me to participate in this. 
uh, I'll continue um, like from where the uh, previous speakers have kind of uh, stopped and we'll try to pick it up from there. Right? I, um, I, I'll reintroduce myself. I am Amra Pali. I teach literature in Kirorimal College, Delhi University. And uh, as an apology, I'm saying that I am not a practicing uh, farmer or agriculturist, uh, but um, because of my um, environment, uh, I, 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 I have some kind of basic familiarity with the world. And I think this is the kind of um, beginning phase of my more uh, long-term engagement with the world of uh, agriculture, right? So, uh, so, so compared to the rest of the speakers, I have uh, very less experience. Like, however, from my little experience, what I can say is uh, basically uh, observing um, the current trends in how, uh, even if it is subsistence level farming, right, but there is a certain kind of uh, uh, de-skilling, especially from uh, the uh, lower Assam part, what I can notice is the de-skilling of uh, female uh, uh, counterparts, right, in agri as uh, agricultural workers, right? So most of them have to spend time uh, doing domestic reproductive work, taking care of children, right, and all other household materials because uh, uh, work jobs in that sense. So when, when for example, uh, let's say the more productive members of the house go into the field, right? Who else takes care of the household, right? So that is one thing that we actually need to take care of, right? Who will do the day-to-day -day reproduction of the uh, uh, family of the labor, right? Of community itself, right? It falls heavily so much on women that uh, uh, we cannot um, we cannot simply look at uh, nostalgic terms in terms of de-skilling of feminine labor in terms of participation of uh, participation in agricultural work. Right? So unless we think more progressively about even the idea of a commune or a more subsidized and uh, benevolent state interventions and um, presence, it will be difficult for us to uh, follow a more progressive regime of re-feminization of agricultural world, right? So that's, that is one part I think we need to basically take care of, right? What allowed women to basically go more and more in, into the domestic space on, uh, despite the fact that on the other side of uh, the same society, there is more and more professionalization in terms of non-agricultural work. So where people are moving out of uh, those domains and to some extent women are left at homes especially in rural areas to uh, tend for the uh, not only the household but also the land right so there is in that sense not only a shortage of labor but also the kind of labor that is expected uh, it is becoming increasingly difficult for women who have mostly no land rights or ownership in their individual at their individual level uh, to basically sustain the um, uh, sustain the land which they may be owning uh, uh, from a secondary position, right, indirectly. Uh, so, uh, for example, if we look at the corporate world, right, the maximization of productivity of corporate workers is uh, uh, con like is in like very visibly subsidized by the domestic labor, unpaid domestic labor that women do in the households, and that is how the corporate world. Uh, basically extracts uh, from this uh, uh, kind of, you know, subsidization of uh, uh, reproductive labor. So this is something that we also need to kind of understand in the context of rural uh, uh, agricultural background. So how, what are the po positive and progressive egalitarian ways in which this subsidization can happen? Right. Other thing is uh, the 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 question of female participation in agriculture in many of the societies um, were very much linked to undivided households earlier. And you can see the imprints of the remnants of that old world now where people uh, don't yet don't know how to negotiate between the modern world with newer patterns of family, nuclear family arising, and there is a uh, uh, outstanding uh, shortfall of uh, labor. Like for example, it has to, just as an instance, uh, for example, uh, the reproductive health or the reproductive cycle of women, right, when it comes to, uh, when, it, when we talk about, um, you know, this kind of labor intensive work regime, right, that also needs to be clocked 
thing. And most of the time, I mean, my own participation in whatever rural uh, work, farming work, has always led me back into thinking that I cannot afford to be unwell or physically unfit if I have to work uh, in this kind of uh, uh, heavy duty labor intensive uh, world. Right. So, so somehow we need to factor in the question of uh, reproductive health apart from the reproductive labor. So I'm just uh, basically uh, bringing out certain pointers. Right. So uh, if uh, we like, if uh, the 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 body clock and how basically seasons operate and how basically we do farming, right? They, they, we, we are as modern society if we are capable or we are able or cognizant of how to time this accordingly, I think uh, it will be a more productive process of how we look at um, uh, uh, more egalitarian uh, agricultural farming life. Right? But at the same time, while shifting, like as someone who has grown up in uh, more, more and more increasingly urbanized space and context, right? so when I go back um, to something like it is a, a kind of going back because uh, that is from where uh, a few of us like had begun our lives. So when we go back uh, to the uh, rural setup, uh, we have to be very careful on in not carrying forth our own uh, ro completely romantic or you know uh, uh, exotic ideas about you know uh, the the life world of rural societies. Right? because that romance is uh, very short-lived and you will realize that it is not very romantic at all. Right? So if we don't essentialize this kind of, you know, uh, edenic, uh, this kind of, you know, uh, 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 romantic lifestyle of rurality, then I think our approach uh, to that world would make, uh, would be not only more pragmatic, but it will be more realistic in what we want to do there. Right? And uh, there is a straight connection between uh, how women's labor in uh, agriculture has uh, has direct links with how they identify with uh, land uh, in the given reality that uh, lands are increasingly becoming more and more uh, inclined towards private ownership. Right? So uh, what is the basis of economic relation uh, and extra economic relation that uh, one would expect uh, from women when uh, we uh, look at more and more possibilities of feminization of labor, right? Because many times, right, yeah, there can be an abstract general love of the land, but when it comes to making it into a productive enterprise, the question of ownership, right? Uh, in, I mean, we can talk about uh, uh, patterns of ownership, but the given reality of the absence of uh, land ownership also uh, brings into question the uh, the, the, the uh, conventional ideas of loyalty, love for the land, and, and then how much do you basically put yourself out into tending that kind of land. And, uh, and, and uh, in last uh, two, three years, um, from my own personal experience, and uh, because of the lockdown uh, and, and the kind of economic crisis that came about, uh, I mean, it was so sad and like, you know, terrifying to look at your uh, vegetable production and simply uh, look at them um, rotting and uh, not able to do anything about it. Right. So in, in, in that process, you know, one uh, sharply realized how agriculture in this kind of environment and also with uh, climate change and all, uh, agriculture has become such a rich man's job, like it is not sustainable unless you have uh, reserve capital and you have enough backup, right, enough resources to fall back on uh, in order to basically recover from this periodic cycles of loss. Uh, both in economic sense of the term, but uh, in terms of uh, sheer direct visual image of something that you produce uh, uh, rotting. Right? So we need to basically also reinvent. Uh, I think we are forced to reinvent our positions of knowing about the climate constantly because of the uh, 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 like unconventional patterns of changes that are happening around us. Uh, um, I mean, sorry, I think I may, yeah, I may be out of time, I guess. Not out of time, but it says a question. Who also okay, so, okay, sorry. Yeah, we'll so continue with that. You are saying, you know, about this whole systematization of agriculture, but also of the economy. 
there's a war which can get into organic economic thinking and the humanitarian. Uh, uh, so, uh, sorry, Anjali, your voice is breaking a little bit. Can you go a little slowly? What I'm saying is that we tend to um, generalize and even <laughs> assume that, you know, the Northeast is this uh, great egalitarian tribal space where women and men are happily doing agriculture. And uh, we think that quickly it can also switch to organic and we think that that's our way out of our economic slump. But obviously what you have shared, what Bono has shared, there are so many challenges. And like now there's a question here, which uh, talks about um, how is it that in the region we're focusing so much on uh, staple grains like rice, maize, etc., and not looking at quote unquote healthier foods or fruits, nuts, vegetables. And so we are also staring at um, an malnutrition uh, in the region. So what do you have to say about that? Any of you can take this uh, question, but I remember Bonaj is making a comment that uh, cash crops are also vegetables. It's something which people are now engaging in in the region. But here, um, Amrapali was just talking about this huge um, wastage because of the lack of the marketing avenues, especially last uh, because of the um, pandemic. So how do we reconcile all these realities? Any one of you can take this question. I think Bonajit and then Bhakto can share the Meghalaya experience of uh, preserving seeds and looking at other types of foods. Seno may like to comment also on the health aspect because I know that in your village you're looking at indigenous agricultural practices but also engaging heavily in looking at health and women's health. So can Bonojit first um, address these concerns? Yeah, uh, but like I already mentioned, I mean ca cash cropping doesn't just mean that you know about sugar cane or tea or things like that. I mean vegetable is very much uh, cash crop. Uh, and so the, there uh, lies the catch when we talk about health. Uh, the market has a very important yeah. role to play in it. Uh, if it, it does not mean that if you are doing vegetable for the, you are doing vegetable cultivation for the uh, market, it does not mean that uh, you know you use like pesticides day and night and you use all kinds of chemical fertilizers. Uh, that, that's that's not the case. Uh, I mean, there there can be ecologically sustainable, uh, economically uh, e ecologically sustainable uh, commercial farming as well. Uh, it's quite possible. We have to just think out of the box. But that can only happen when uh, access to market is guaranteed. So here comes the uh, notion of food sovereignty. It, play, it, it becomes a key concept here. Like the village I live in, right now I'm in Delhi. I came to Delhi yesterday for some work. The village I live in is 25 kilometers away from the nearest town. Uh, but in my village market, the tomato you will buy will come from Nasik. Why can't we grow tomatoes in our village for the market? The market is present in the village itself. We don't have to look towards the city because people are buying and eating. So, I mean, my access to market becomes so crucial here. And why are people now gradually even moving away from subsistence farming? Because it takes up uh, time. Subsistence farming is more, uh, you need to devote actually more time. Uh, but at the same time, like I mentioned earlier, like 75% of your life world has been taken over by market and you cannot, I mean, market relations, cash, money, and you cannot run away from, from that. So what is exactly happening right now in our villages in Assam is that people have stopped dreaming. The government is giving, uh, you know, giving cash through various schemes and they are surviving with that. Food security they already have. People are still into foraging 
various herbs and wild fruits and things and fish. Uh, fish is a major source of uh, protein uh, in Assam. And I mean, you, you, you don't have to buy fish from the market. I mean, you put a trap in your pedophile at night and you have fish for next two days. Uh, so people are doing that, but how will people tackle the part of the life world that has been taken over by market relations? So to survive and to dream, they need money. And subsistence agriculture is not sufficient. I mean, if we continue with this paradox where 75% of your life world is controlled by cash and market relations, and you just eat from your subsistence farming. If we, if we continue with this paradox, we will be killing off dreams. Human beings remain human beings by dreaming, dreaming about better things, better perhaps, future. Perhaps the crisis- so People have to survive just on the doles of the government to mm -hmm. deal with the uh, part of your life that has been taken over by market. Mm -hmm. I think, I think mm -hmm. it's uh, absolutely unsustainable. I mean, uh, people people won't survive. You can't just survive by eating just food. So the crisis really is about our marketing systems and the yeah over, I guess. So Bhaktu, what do you have to say? Because uh, in your work, also Seno, you all have been trying to focus, no, on bringing back the focus to kitchen gardens, to subsistence farming, to using indigenous seeds and practices, is it really possible with the onslaught of the kind of development narrative that, that is there? What do you uh, have to uh, Okay, so we are not asking people to switch to organic farming. They already are doing organic, organic farming because traditionally they have been doing that. They're not asking people to switch, asking people not to switch to another farming. Because if you see in Meghalaya itself, the consumption of fertilizers and pesticides is not so high as compared to other parts of the country because of course we're hilly area, the green nutrition never really got here so much. So in a way, we are still having a lot of it. So we are not asking to switch them. We, we already have it. That's one point. Regarding the health aspect, now we're talking about starchy st staples like rice and wheat and other things. Uh, maybe starchy staples not just rice and wheat. They also are your potatoes. They also are your taro. They also are your maize. They also are your millet. Millet, which was an important indigenous food in the past. So there are many different ways in which how we can grow food security, not just from concentrating on one rice, on one wheat. Uh, because there are because how did people in uh, Bolivia Andes survive on or without uh, without rice? They survived in potatoes. How did people in the Micronesia, Polynesia, all those island nations survive? They survived in yam. So I mean, there are imaginations be possible. In fact, if you go to uh, Sora area, you ask people in the past, what did they used to have? They used to have shrew, and it's a starchy staple. In fact, very high calcium also, so it's good for the bones. And in fact, that is what they were doing before the PDA system, before all the rice came in and started saying to them, you know what, if you're eating your starchy staple, you are a poor person. All this forest food is only for poor people. And therefore, you know, this whole idea has come about that unless you're eating the market food, and we have done research in NASFA, have shown that the local food have got more micronutrients than the market food. I mean, like you have also something like uh, orange sweet potato, orange swallow sweet potato, which was used by the World Bank for a project in Africa to combat malnutrition, especially stunting. How many of us have seen, or how many of us in Meghalaya have seen orange sweet potato? It's grown in Makundro district, it's grown in Makundro block, it's grown in Ribhoi district, you know? So like, there's so much diversity here which can fulfill our need for carbohydrate, food security. You talk, and your body doesn't need only carbohydrate, doesn't need only protein. Protein you can get from insects also. You, we were having insects, we were having so many items from the forest. We have forgotten all of that. So, I mean, and you're talking about food for the rich or farming for only for the rich. Why is it that? Because is it not because of the highly su support based system to green revolution? It's not because of that. Why can't the system incentive be there for small farmers? Because whatever you do, the, the, the future of farming has to be small farmers because that's the only way you can produce healthy food. If you're going to go for large scale farming, you're going to have machinery, you're going to have lots of chemicals, weeding will be a problem. How will you do weeding? You got to do hand by hand. You have to use pesticides for that. And pesticides have been found to have a lot of health, health impacts. You're going to grow vegetables and large scale, you're going to do that. You need to have a lot of man labor. So therefore it has to be small farmers. Small farmers have been producing 70% of the food in the world are produced by small farmers. 
I mean, there is a lot of there is a lot of imagination going on. I mean, like because of the narratives they've been pushing. FAO in the beginning, initial 1950s, said that jhum cultivation is bad for agriculture. Now they think it's good. Why do you think it's good? Because they have found they did not do anything at back then. Now they're starting to do research. We are doing research. We found that no, it's sustainable. Suddenly now they realize that all the things we are doing for the last thousands of years, 10,000 years we've been doing agriculture, we survived. Suddenly now 200, 300 years, industrial farming comes along, the market lodging comes along, we can't survive. I mean, that's preposterous, in my opinion, regarding the, the role of women in terms of feminization. That's happening even in Meghaya. More than 50% of the agricultural labor is women. Men are going to the cities, going to urban areas. Why is it happening? That has to do also with cash. Because if you look, even in rural areas, wherever there's cash cropping going on, wherever people start doing cash cropping, the role of women, the, the, the economic power of women has gone down because men are the ones who take all the cash. So that's happening. So that's the cash economy you're talking about. Therefore, the contract farming is going to happen, which is going to take place if we allow the three laws to function, which will be very bad for the women because it will reduce the power of women more and more. So therefore, it's the whole institution. Sorry. Okay. So, um, so, so many other questions are coming in. Um, we mentioned about millets. So there's a question directly about millets that you know, the United Nations can provide from the millets in the millets. I think Steno. Uh, there's a big focus in Chizami of looking at millets and cultivation of millets. Uh, there's also a question about whether we're also facing a crisis because there has been a takeover of traditional lands, especially those managed uh, in, uh, you know, Jhum. So, mm -hmm. would you like to respond to these two questions? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, just before coming to, you know, uh, the... the question of Milad, I just want to add one more point on the uh, overburden of women or, uh, with all these, you know, like agriculture activities. I think, you know, like uh, what we need to do now is that we need to redistribute, you know, uh, care work, redistribution of care work. That's important. And also, I think it's important to introduce, to, to give, you know, women-friendly tools, which can be handled by, you know, like, uh, uh, women and also in the kind of, of, you know, like the landscape that we, we work on. So I think that is something that I wanted to share. Yeah, millet has been, you know, like almost a forgotten grain, though it has been part of a culture, though it has been part of our food uh, uh, habit. Of course, like uh, amongst Nagas also like rice used to be the staple food for many of the ethnic groups. And uh, millet used to be the supplement uh, kind of a, you know, a grain that comes when the when the families in the communities have um, a lean period before the pedi is cultivated, I mean, harvested. So it has been, you know, like our traditional food, but owing to, you know, like for last three decades or so, jhum cultivation is considered to be, you know, like primitive. It used to be very destructive. It is something that is contributing to climate change, global warming and whatnot. And that is the reason where we have almost like a lot of, you know, like the farming communities abandoned jhum cultivation because of all this, you know, like blaming of, you know, branding it as primitive, not sustainable. And, you know, like we need to, uh, to emphasize on agroforestry, tree plantation and whatnot, which, you know, the small farmers, landholders cannot even dream of having a tree plantation, you know, like even, you know, 20 trees to uh, rear or to nurture for the next 20, 30 years before they harvest. So it is something, you know, like, uh, you know, Millet has been, you know, slowly coming back with the coming back of the June cultivation. And also, of course, like a lot needs to be done because, you know, like there is a need to support and it's to support like the processing machines and all because it is difficult to process. There is also a need to encourage the larger community to have the kind of community farming that, that they used to, um, they used to, uh, uh, do and I think you know, like when we are talking about millets, we are not only talking about what the millet grain crop itself. It is about the diverse farm that grows along with millets, and that is why you know, like millet doesn't grow in isolation. When we are talking about millets, we are also talking about 30, 40 types of crops that grows on the uh, slopes, and it is important that uh, uh, you know this is something that. Uh, we also have to uh, to uh, uh, 
I think it is also important that, you know, we have to look at the different multiple securities that it offers. It offers, you know, like it's ecological, it's also very nutritious comparatively, you know, like with rice, there is, you know, scientific, you know, studies done on those. And also it is, it is you know, like um, it has many, many, I should say, benefits. And I was told that in in uh, even in Assam and all like Najuli Islands in the bank of Brahmaputra also there used to be you know millets and I'm sure that in Karbi alone those hill uh, hill uh, tribes where the I think they they I mean they still have millets though it has gone down a lot and now it is you know like even the government is starting to you know acknowledge it and yeah there's uh, recently like it was announced that international year of millet is announced for you know 2023 and i think there is a whole lot of you know need to also uh, see look back reflect back because here also comes very important that i have missed in my earlier presentation because of the time shortage that there is a, 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 a change in the land holding systems the commons are shrinking the commons like this the land the forest the water resources you know the seeds even people's knowledge are shrinking. And I think we need to relook because all this, when we don't have land, then, you know, like, and when we are pushing, you know, like commercial agriculture, when we are pushing plantations, monoculture, then it is the rich who will be expanding and the, the shrinking of land holding amongst the poor marginalized families in the communities uh, shows up. And this is what we have seen even in our own uh, communities. I'm from the rural uh, background. I'm from the village. I've been living here for more than four decades. So, you know, like that's like even in my own community, we have seen these changes, the land holding pertain system, and this will um, directly affect, uh, you know, like uh, the kind of crops, the, the kind of ecological agriculture that we are uh, talking. And here we need, you know, different stakeholders to come in. Uh, I don't know whether I have. Uh, Thanks, and yeah. when you see um, uh, different stakeholders, we're really running short of time, but uh, this is an open question to any of the panelists. Uh, do you think that um, what is also essential to look at is state intervention into our attempts of agriculture? And the other last question, which perhaps we can close with after hearing from each one of you, is do you think that um, the Northeast, each and every state at that level requires a kind of, um, organizing, better organizing among those who are practicing agriculture in the states, mm -hmm. but as well as trying to forge uh, a kind of collaboration in the state in the region. And that's the way forward then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, given that we, I mean, our reality is a reality of nation state, and uh, we, we, we can't exit outside uh, the boundaries of state. And most of us are talking about cultivation in territorial terms, right? are, like, because that is our reality. So, uh, and I think much of the problem in agriculture, like the crisis coming up is because of the receding of state responsibility, right? In every aspect of agriculture, right? Not just the marketing, but everything else. So, I mean, uh, uh, obviously, when we talk about return to a more, uh, uh, quote unquote, sustainable communal forms of, you know, co-cultivation and all, we are definitely going back there because of the crisis that state has created uh, in by increasingly minimizing its presence and pushing it to the private sectors. And I, I don't think we need to elaborate. I mean, there are details after details after details, you know, with a lot of farmer suicides happening in other parts of this country, right? Uh, 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 comparatively, even if the Northeast society in general has not seen such debilitating levels of poverty, right, com like you know, uh, compared to many other states in the country, but uh, we are not going, we are not very far from that, right? If uh, the reorganization doesn't start from now, mm -hmm. uh, so I think state intervention is required. Uh, not as a permanent form of uh, 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 subsidiary or aid, right? But alongside a critique of this uh, uh, state intervention, which uh, tries to uh, kind of you know swallow up all traditional systems that that should not happen, right? So we are talking about local realities. We are talking about, but at the same time, it should not be parochial, right? So 
I think uh, to have a critical bent of mind uh, in whatever choices that we make is very important. But I don't see right now, currently, without state intervention, how sustainable each of this, uh, especially small farmers, can be. On to the others. Anybody else would like to add to that? Uh, I think I agree with Amrapali when she says the invention is very important because Green Revolution was the invention. First of all, Mission Organic in Meghalaya was the invention. Now, but there are also good state intervention in terms of the PDS system. Now, in South India, as far as I know, we have introduced millet into the PDS system. Now, millet is very important, Shana was very correct, because it also contains iron, anemia. Anemia cases are very high in Meghalaya, Nagaland, everywhere, and Meghalaya especially very high. Now, uh, you have uh, iron from anemia, uh, sorry, from millet, and also millet is a very, very good crop in terms of climate change adaptation because it can grow in very like, thin soil, very low rainfall, I mean, in all kinds, all kinds of environment. So millet is a super crop, a climate smart crop, and it's an indigenous crop. From long time they were cultivating, but now because it was not tasty, because you need more rice from other parts of the country, therefore you were living that. So state animation is very, very important. In terms of farmer suicide, why they are doing suicide? Is it because they have been become in debt? How have they become in debt? The loan? Where they are, why they taking so much money? Why they taking so much loan? So is it because they're using too much input? Is maybe they're going for large scale farming, they can't handle it. Sometimes there's a, there's like, there's a drought, there's a crop failure. So all those things are very important. State intervention is very important. Yes, I think we can do with that. Uh, but I would say is that, uh, you know, it can be used in a good way also in a bad way also. Very good example I'll give you Brazil. In Brazil, what they did was that they had a school feeding program, which India has one of the largest in the world. They said, okay, 20, 30% of your school feeding program, everything that you come from the school feeding, the food has to come from small farmers. That was a law they made in Brazil. And really helped many small farmers, especially organic, or not I would say organic, as indigenously produced, like nature positive ecological agriculture. So yes, state, so yes, it can happen, and we need a pro, I need proper state intervention. I think if we get that, we'll strengthen more. Even without that, I think we should have to go on with our way because if we just uh, depend on the state, which is so much corporate uh, corporatized right now, we'll be in trouble. We cannot we cannot wait for that. Uh, yeah, just my last bit of word. I believe in the principle of localization. And especially after COVID-19, you know, nothing works better than local production, local consumption, and local distribution. And that doesn't mean that subsistence agriculture or ecological agriculture doesn't reach market. But the shorter, you know, they travel, the better it is for the world, and especially in the times of climate crisis. And I want to end, uh, you know, here with that we cannot uh, 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 separate ecological issues with our livelihood, whether it is agriculture or peripheral uh, discipline, and it is and also the social justice that we talk about. We cannot separate. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Zeno. I think those are the lovely words to end this uh, webinar on. I wish we could carry on because there's still so much to discuss. And I know me, for one, I've learned so much today. And I think to sum up, uh, all of you have emphasized on the need to, at that level, uh, protect the farming systems that are there in the region, the biodiverse rich um, farming systems. And uh, the crisis, I guess, is not really in agriculture. I don't know if I can make such a, a statement, but it is in uh, the fact that we're always looking outside, looking to the uh, larger structures of corporation and actually handing it over to them. Uh, so hopefully, you know, with more discussions like this, we can um, support each other and also help the communities. Uh, I guess what is really required is to bring the communities together and mobilize those actually engaged in farming and think locally. All of you have kept emphasizing about the need to look at markets within to begin with and not get trapped into this idea that we have to produce for others and produce big scale. So thank you so much to each and every one of you. I really wish we could have carried on because I know that I had cut Bonajit short, I had cut Anra Pali and all of you short at some point because of trying to keep uh, to time. But I hope that we can have a discussion like this again. Uh, Zuban will be having some more webinars uh, as part of the C Cultures of Peace uh, Festival. The next one is scheduled for the 29th. So do watch the space. There will be a publicity material so that you know who will be the speakers and what theme around ecology we will once again be visiting on the 29th of this month. Thank you once again, Bhokto, Bonajit, Seno, Amrapali. Hope to meet you again at some discussion. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you all from uh, Juban also. Uh, it has been a very thought provoking and insightful discussion as Angela has pointed out. Thank you all the participants also uh, for joining us. The recording of this webinar will be put online on YouTube and to view our previous uh, earlier webinars for Cultures of Peace, Fragrance of Peace, and our other programs like Through Hard Lanes, Reframing the Domestic and the Crisis of Care, Feminist Perspectives on the COVID-19 Pandemic and Lockdown in India. You can go to our YouTube page. Uh, the link will be given in the chat box. Our next webinar is on Wednesday, uh, 29th September from 4 to 5 p.m. And we will continue to engage with the issues raised uh, race in these conversations through future webinars. So please do follow us on social media for the future events. Have a good day, everyone, and goodbye. Thank you.